to everybody. I am very thankful to Think India, this wonderful organization, to invite me today to speak on the subject Ek Pehchan Bharatiyata, One Identity Bharatiyata or Indianness. So I will start with uh, a prayer to Shiva. Ganga Taranga Ramani Ajata Kalapam Gauri Nirantar Vibhushit Vamabhagam Narayana Priyam Ananga Madapaharam Varanasi Purapatim Bhaja Vishwanatham Varanasi Purapatim Bhaja Vishwanatham our country is going through a lot of intellectual as well as political and social turmoil. It is important at this moment to understand that the people of the nation must believe in a firm, well-defined, firm and well-defined national identity. Identity of the one nation that extends from the Himalaya to the South Sea Kanyakumari, from Jagannath Puri in the east to Dwarka Puri in the west. Now this nation as we have today must be very clear about its national identity. And therefore, whether we are in the nation as a student, as a parent, as a worker, as an artist, a poet, a writer, a factory worker, a politician, whatever may be our social group, we have to see that our national identity is clear to us because we are going to behave and work for the nation together with other inhabitants of the nation only if that identity is clear to us. If we are fuzzy about it, if we don't understand whom we are, who we are, what we are, where we come from, and what is our future, then we will also not know what we have to do in the present. That's why the question of identity, jisko Hindi mein pehchan kehte hai, something by which you recognize yourself and by which you want others to be recognized, others to recognize you. You see, it is not just a matter of how I define myself. Because how I define myself or how I define my nation, how I define my country, is also related to how I want that others should see me. It's as simple as that. If my name my name personally is Bharat Gupt, then I think of myself as this body which carries this name, this personality as Bharat Gupt. And I want that others should recognize me as Bharat Gupt. They should not recognize me as uh, somebody else, as John, Peter, Muhammad, uh, Sunil or whatever. They should recognize me as Bharat Gupt and the person that I am, the face that I have. The same applies to the nation. So, first we must be clear who we are. Once that's clear, then we can tell others that look, we are this and you better recognize us as this and this and nothing else. You may have your opinion about us, no matter what kind of opinion, good or bad, you are free to have opinion. This is a free world. 
but our identity is this and we want you to accept respect our identity now this is very important so the first thing is we should be clear who are we now this is where the great debate begins you must be hearing these days that there are many versions of what is called the idea of India. What is India? What is Bharat? What is Hindustan? What is Sindhu Desh? You see, all these words are thrown around and questions are asked. So some people say that India or Bharat is this, this and this. Some others say, no, that's not what Bharat is. Bharat is different. So somebody has an idea of India, which he says, this is the right, the true idea of India. Somebody else says, no, no, that's not it. I'll give you an idea of India. But then, let's face the fact that there is India. India as a culture that goes back to recorded history of more than seven, eight thousand years in terms of archaeology, in terms of even the texts, it goes back to a very, very ancient time. There may be a controversy as to how old the oldest text, the Rig Veda is, but it is certainly very, very old. And we have other than the text one, we have a whole tradition given to us by archaeology, given to us by geology of this nation. Now that is there. That textual tradition is there. It's not for anybody to debate about whether it is there or it is not, whether it should be recognized or not. No. Nations and civilizations, they live by their texts. So, if you talk to a Greek and you say that, look, I'm not going to take into account your earliest known text, that is the poetry of Homer, I'm going to forget that. I'm going to keep that out. No, no Greek would accept it because that's where their tradition begins. The textual tradition begins and then it comes down similarly for us. We have a textual tradition by which we are known. So our identity is defined more than anything else by our great textual tradition that we have. And it is through those texts that we learn about what kind of ideas about civilization, about the divinities, about practices, about human relations that people had in ancient times and then how as time went along those ideas changed. Now I'm going to talk about first when I discuss the ideas of India to you, I'm going to talk about some of the common notions or the ideas of India. Now one of the most uh, talked about idea is the Nehruvian idea. The Nehruvian idea is something like this, that India is a very, very old civilization and culture. It goes back down, uh, goes back into hoary past. But the most important thing for Jawaharlal Nehru was that this civilization was made by a series of invaders or outsiders. So you know the whole sequence of it. I need not repeat it. There were the, the Aryans, so-called Aryans who came somewhere from Russia or somewhere from other part of Europe and they came and settled in the Indus Valley and then they mixed with the people and created another combined uh, civilization and this whole thing went on 
After that period, there were other invaders who came into India, like Alexander came, and uh, then after Alexander, the Shakas and the Hunas and other Central Asian tribes came, and finally, uh, in the 8th century, there was an Arab invasion, and later on in the 10th and 11th century, Islamic invasions uh, happened, and they kept happening in one wave after another for a very long time, till the arrival of the British, and then when India got free from the British in 1947, a new nation was born. So this is the story and this is the history of civilization as a series of invaders that made up this civilization. So the Nehruvian idea was largely the British idea. It was very much the British notion that India is a place which has been always open to invaders and outside and they have contributed to make its civilization. For that very reason, the British were no different. The British were doing what had been happening for all these years through the Indian history. So if the Aryans invaded it first of all, then the British also invaded India last of all and they did nothing new, India should better accept it, and India should accept the contributions of the British, just as it should accept the great contributions of the Islamic kings, just as it should accept the great contributions of the Aryan invaders, and uh, the language Sanskrit, which is the hallmark of Indian history. So, just as all these things through history had to be accepted, similarly the British rule also had to be accepted. So this was the model which was uh, pushed into our minds by Jawaharlal Nehru. And when, uh, after 1947, he came to power and ruled the country till 1964, uh, this was taken to be the official history of India and this was taught in schools. So this is the history which can be summed up in one line, a poetic line in Urdu, Karwa aate gaye, Hindosta banta gaya. That is, People, came, uh, people kept coming in, uh, in caravans one after another and they constructed the civilization of India. So it is the people from outside, some invaders, some migrants, some uh, who, have e who may have even taken refuge like the Parsis, they all came in and India is the great country which never invaded everybody. It's the great country which was invaded by everybody and hence it got its identity. So, this was called the palimpsest culture. You know what is a palimpsest? Uh, in ancient times in Europe, particularly in, in Greece and the Christian empires, people used to write on a book which consisted of many leaves made out of leather. So you took one leaf and on that leaf with a, a sharp uh, pencil without a lead but with a sharp metallic edge you etched out something, you scratched a letter or you wrote a text and you filled the page and you filled the book, whatever you wanted to write. After a few years, you thought you would use the book again. So you rubbed 
erased as we erase it with a rubber eraser, the writing of a pencil today, then people had some uh, instrument to erase that writing and write again. So you could sometimes write two to three times on a single book. But what happened was that the first and the second writing would also peep through the third writing. So this was called a palimpsest. Jawaharlal Nehru said that whatever is the present consists of what has been in the past and it can be seen as living. So India is a palimpsest culture. Another way of putting the whole thing is that India is like a, like a hotel, like a sarai. That you come, you sit here, you live here, you don't have to go back, it's a hotel which you have never to vacate and you all live together. Now, there is no denying the fact that people came from outside India, that a large number of them were invaders, they were not migrants all of them, some of them were terrible invaders and they did a lot of loot, plunder and destruction. There is no denying the fact that this happened throughout the course of our history. There is certainly a big debate whether there were any Aryans at all or not who came from outside India. And there is plenty of evidence now to believe that the Aryas were people who belonged to India. But even if we don't go into that controversy, we have to accept the fact that many people came from outside and they brought different kinds of ideas and technologies and uh, various impact. However, the fundamental question is something else. And that question is, that if people came from outside and just started living here, then just by the sheer fact of living and adjusting with each other, could they make a civilization? Do you have a civilization in a hotel? What is the civilization of a hotel or a temporary lounge or a place where people from all kinds of places come and just sit. That place has no homogeneity. That place has no identity. That place has no pehchan. That place does not seem like a single organic unit. If many people are just staying together, then they must have certain fundamental ideas of how to live together. They must have certain ideas about what is life, why life is to be lived, how life is to be lived, what is the aim of life, what are the values that we should have, what is it that we live for. Now, unless those things are very clear and agreed upon, people of different cultures or people of great diversity from within India cannot live together as organic whole. This is very important to understand. So, karma aate rahe aur civilization ya sanskriti banate rahe aisa nahi ho sakta. So the line karva aate rahe hindostan banta gaya is false depiction of history. Karvao ke aane se aur settle ho jane se sanskriti ya nation ya rashtra ya sabhyata nahi ban sakti. It is not possible that if people one after another pour in then they make a civilization 
in which people have certain common aims and goals. Unless there is a philosophy of life, unless there are ideals of life which are common and accepted by those very diverse people, by the people from outside or from within, there can be no single civilization. Otherwise, there would be constant wars and there would be nothing like an Indian civilization. There would be nothing like what we can define and what we can recognize as a civilizational unit which is distinctly different, different from China, different from Greece, different from Egypt, different from Africa, in every respect of life. So unless the people had this sorted out very early in history, they could not have absorbed the people who came from outside, the people who sought refuge like the Parsis or the people who invaded in heavy numbers or the people who came in small numbers and started ruling here like the Greeks did for a while in a small portion of India which is now Kazakhstan etc where they had their Indo-Bactrian kingdom or when the Shakas came and they got absorbed into the Indian society or when the Central Asians who came and even became kings like Kushan and got absorbed here according to the lifestyle and the values which people were following. Now we have to be clear that this is something that happened and it was some fundamental notions about what is India, what is civilization, what is divinity, what is God, what is man, what is earth, what is the purpose of life. When these values were very clear and they were mature values that others could come and accept them. This is the most important thing. So, the culture of India is not a palimpsest culture which just got created because certain things were thrown together. Culture of India is not a melting pot. You know, the Americans were talking about their notion of America as a melting pot. And they said that this is where everybody loses his identity and becomes one with the American way of life. So they thought of America as a melting pot. Then after a while they said, no, no, melting pot is one in which, like in a soup, nothing distinct can be seen, but only the soup is seen. So let us talk of diversity, let us talk of distinct things and therefore this whole notion of the nation as a melting pot was replaced by America and a new paradigm or a new example was set and that was of the salad bowl. That in a salad bowl you can arrange different things. So pieces of orange remain pieces of orange along with pieces of apples and other fruit salads and things and everything has a distinct personality and is arranged together in a big design. So they said America is a salad bowl. Now this is something which plagued them. In India, we never went in for a melting pot because we believed in diversity and that diversity of people was preserved whether it was to some extent brought from outside India or it was created within India. As a matter of fact one must understand 
that not much of diversity was brought into India from outside India. A very few things were brought from outside. The great diversity of Indian civilization was created within India. The large number of languages that we have today and we always had a large number of languages. It is not that today we have something like 30-35 major languages and hundreds of dialects. We always had 20, 25, 30 languages, distinct languages, quite different languages even 2000 years ago or even 2600, 700, 3000 years ago. We had those languages. Our literary texts provide all the evidence for those languages. So we had that diversity and these were not languages which were imported no, they were languages which were created within India. So, this whole notion that values existed in the Indian civilization from very early times. And because they existed from very early times and formulated into certain major texts. Because they were brought down to society at large, therefore they provided a framework to develop new diversity and also to absorb what came in from outside whether through invaders, whether through refugees, whether through migrants, whatsoever. This is the most important thing. So India was more or less, if you want to talk about an illustration, if you want to talk about a paradigm or what is called in Sanskrit a drishtanta, then India is like a very very huge banyan tree. There was a root, there was a trunk and there were leaves and branches and slowly the leaves and branches grew large and from within the branches other roots came down and became uh, the trunks of the tree. And it is under this banyan tree that people from outside came, lived and settled just as the people of this country were always living. So it is this great tree example, a tree which provides shelter, but there is the identity of the tree. Now as I said, this is always dependent on certain very distinct values. It is not without values that you can have a framework in which diversity can be created, in which change can be assimilated. So let us talk about some of those fundamental values that we find in our country right from the earliest times. I'm going to talk now about those values which were there from very early times and which adjusted itself, enlarged itself over different centuries, in fact millenniums, to arrive at the point 
where we are today in modernity. So, how do we get to know what were these values? How do we get to know when were these values formulated for the first time, for the earliest time? Well, we have to go to our texts. You see, archaeological sites cannot reveal everything. No archaeological artifact can be explained unless there is some kind of a linguistic text to explain what this thing is. So if you find some kind of a uh, sign made on a stone slab, you cannot make any sense of that sign unless there is somebody to explain this sign, this image, this image of a bird or an animal or a letter. And it is the text that do it. So let us go to the earliest text, the Vedas and the Upanishads. And there we find certain fundamental values which are enshrined from very early times. I'll very quickly, very uh, hurriedly more or less, go through these uh, and uh, tell you what they have been and how they have uh, sustained our culture throughout our history and how they have even altered and given rise to a huge diversity of philosophies, a huge diversity of opinion as to how one has to live, what one has to do. Now in this, the first and the foremost value that was developed in India was something like this. And this value was that it is possible to worship divinity either through an icon or without an icon. So you could perform a yajna for a divinity without making an icon of that divinity or you could make an icon, a pratima, a murti or a vigraha or a mandir for that divinity and offer your worship that way. This is something which happens very, very early. The Vedic Devatas, as they are described in the Vedic mantras, they all have shapes and size and characteristics they are all what is called with characteristics or sakar. So the worship of this devata with quality is present in the Vedic text itself. And if it was there in the Vedic text, then it was a small transition to make a pratima or make a vigra or an icon. So this achievement in India was done very early. Namely, I must repeat as it's very important that you can worship the divine without making a murti of it or you can worship the divine by making a murti. This was achieved in India right in the Vedic times or very soon after the age of the Rig Vedas, etc. The other Vedas. And hence we escaped what has been in other parts of the world and now of course threatens the whole world. We escaped that big battle between two groups. One group saying that the divine can have no form and hence those who worship him as a form or an idol or a murti are in error. 
and they must be changed. Their icons must be destroyed. They must be converted. Now this problem which arose from the Judaic times continued into the Christian and the Islamic times and is continuing to this present day. And today we see that it is very close to us this problem in the shape of Taliban right at our borders. So this big gruesome conflict did not occur in India because the wise men of India, the Rishis, the Manishis, the intellectuals, they saw the truth that divinity manifests itself in both ways because divinity has no limitation in, on its power. Divinity can be this, divinity can be that, divinity can be anything, the divine can be anything. Now this was one of the fundamental values of Indian civilization. And then it was also dis accepted that not one but many kinds of shapes are taken by the divine. That the divine appears to its devotees, not one, but many kinds of shapes and sizes. It can be Usha, it can be Indra, it can be um, Agni, it can be so many of them, so many of Devatas. And later on the Devatas kept on taking new shapes, Upendra, in, in, after Indra, Upendra, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, Ganesh, etc., etc., is a huge number. This was accepted in India. And along with this, there were hundreds of icons which were made by people living in the forest, in the mountains, by the rivers, in far off places, from centers of so-called uh, capitals of the world, they were all accepted. This was possible because of a philosophic choice. This was a value which was entertained in India. This was what made the soul and the spirit of India. So this is where diversity or anekata was accepted. So aneka anek, ek anek. The ek leads to anek. Ek becomes anek and remains ek. Ek anek, both the one and the only, the one without the other, and the one as many. This was a fundamental philosophic notion which laid the foundations of Indian culture. So the first I said is that you can worship God as form or without form. The second that there can be many forms. And the third most important thing was acceptance of the fact that this whole creation is dependent upon action. The creation came into existence because of the desire of the one to become many and it is the desire to do things, to work, to do karma, to action that keeps the whole world going. Inanimate, animate things, both they work according to karma. And for the human beings, karma is something which is good or bad, which is highly sophisticated, which is vital, or which can be dark. It can be sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. So karma in any case is 
what moves things forward and it is something which has consequence so i make my own life i make my own future and i am responsible for what i am today because i have made myself this was one of the most fundamental ideas which was accepted as a fundamental notion the fourth major indian notion was that of dharma dharma is the eternal law that there are things which are unchangeable there are convenient things and laws which are dependent on time and place like what kind of food you eat depends upon where you live what kind of clothing you wear depends upon the environment in which you are settled so these are the changing aspects but there is the notion the eternal law of which was called in the vedic script uh, vedic text as rit and which was again later defined as dharma that which sustains you and that which sustains you consists of all the three things the divinity and karma the fifth notion that came into india and is a very important notion is that of rebirth that is you die and then you are reborn in another body and this notion of rebirth is actually an extension of the belief in karma that i am somebody who does not die but because of my action i am reborn it is not only till i have attained the notion of perfect equanimity the status of perfection that i will stop being reborn so these were the idea of rebirth and the idea of rebirth is not a fatalistic idea it's a creative idea then indian society was the divided into various categories various social norms obligations the notion of five debts that you have you have the debt towards the gods you have the debt towards the teachers you have the debt towards the parents you have a debt to the environment and you have a debt to the human beings that who who uh, are around you and among whom you live so this concept of being obliged to perform for others this is very different from the modern notion of rights you see today we talk of freedom today we talk of equality today we talk of friendship or fraternity in which there is no discrimination of high and low all these values are fine so long there is also a very clear definition of what other than rights are our duties unless we know what to give to others unless we know what are the actions in which there is a desire to give we will not be able to enjoy our freedoms so we are free but we are free to do certain duties if there are no duties freedom becomes something freedom becomes something which is chaos and that's what's happening in the democracies of the world today they have transcended uh, they have uh, degenerated 
into some kind of a chaos sooner or later. They, they, they are going to do that. And maybe as Plato said that they would degenerate into plutocracy and then into dictatorship. The Indian notions of life depended upon, entirely depended upon rina or obligations or duties and it was very important. So, these were some of the fundamental notions. Now you will come around and tell me that yes, but these are Hindu notions. Well, they are certainly Hindu notions because India has been a Hindu country for maybe 5,000, 6,000 years. Christians and Muslims come into it at a later time. And there are certain values like karmavad which they both accept. Of course there are certain values which they may not want to share with the Hindu majority. They may have certain different notions like there is no belief of rebirth in the Abrahamic tradition, there is only one life. But if you look at it very closely, that does not contradict the Hindu notion of rebirth. Because if somebody wants to achieve the ultimate after a single life, he or she is welcome to do it. If somebody wants that one should have not just one chance, but many chances. One should have not one life, but many lives. And if one should be able to work out one's salvation, not in a single, but in several lives, I don't think there is a fundamental contradiction. The contradiction arises when some people start believing that theirs is the only right way and the way of others is wrong and others have to be corrected and if others resist it that they have to be eliminated so when things come to this kind of intolerant uh, intolerant behavior then conflict arises as long as it is accepted that let people accept and let people live according to their own notions of what is God or what is after life and what is this fundamental value of life. If there is an acceptance, then I think there is no great contradiction. So I have given you a picture of uh, what are the notions on which Indian nationalism rests. Now, some of these notions have been called Sanatan Dharma. And Sri Aurobindo in his Uttarpada speech said that Sanatan Dharma is Indian nationalism. Similarly, a little later, uh, Savarkar, in 1923, he said that apart from the idea of believing in a territory, a territory which I defined right at the beginning of my lecture as India, apart from that, unless you believe that there is a culture, a Sanskriti, and which is obviously repeatedly by mentioning all those texts defines as the Sanskriti enshrined in those texts just as I have done and given you fundamental values of those texts behind those texts unless you believe in all this you cannot believe in a single nation these are not notions which deprive people from the freedom 
of defining the ultimate reality in their own way, of thinking of God as Father or God as Supreme Being. They are not notions that prohibit metaphysical speculations. These are notions which are highly tolerant and which promote the well-being of others and which promote the notion of a fulfilled, artistic and a beautiful life. So thank you very much and now you can ask me questions. Thank you so much sir. You have cleared so many ideas about the, about the identity of our country, about the citizens. Uh, so I have a question. Yes. When uh, when we talk about uh, creating a narrative, yes, like every country has a narrative, we don't. But when we talk about it, we have so many uh, different cultures, diversity in our own country. Yes. Uh, what could be that one thing, uh, you know, a person could stand up and say, yes, I can connect with it and this is my identity. Uh, whether it is not, uh, whether it is, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, people uh, say that, no, I do not believe in idol worshipping, uh, no, I follow Buddha, so I am a different person, I am not a Hindu, they say, we are, we are sick, so we are not in that part. So what could be that one thing, so that everybody could relate to, uh, I mean, it was earlier spirituality, but now, what could be it? I mean, it, it, it has lost its parts. Well, could be? Uh, you see, I gave you a whole talk about how immense diversity rests upon the idea that all diversity comes from a single source. In this material world or in this world, there will be all kinds of identities that people will have. Just as there are people with different skin colors. Some people would be dark, some are fair, some are very fair. Right? Because that's the way the world is made. That's the way the environment is. Similarly, there are people who would like to think of divinity as Buddha, some others as Jain. But one must understand, and this is what India has preached, that behind all these identities of both Buddha, Jain, of Yajna, of Shiva, of Parvati, of Devi, and all this, there is one single reality that this diversity comes out of a single reality, the ultimate divine. If you remember, if you, if you uh, uh, try to recall, this is the first thing that I said, that India developed this idea that it is out of the single one experience, or experience of the divine that there is manifestation of different pratimas or vigrahas or diversity of items. So to say that there will be only one ideal, there will be only one image, there will be only one flag, this is unreal. Yes, a country will have one flag. A nation will have one flag. Like United States of America has stars and stripes, and England as Union Jack and Bharat as Tiranga. So these are things which are very specific. But when it comes to art, when it comes to religion, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to aspirations, then you cannot have a single emblem. Just as can you, can there be a single face for every India? That this is the face, this is the feature, everybody will be like this? No, that's yes. not part of God's plan.
plan. That's not part of nature. Na diversity is built into nature. But behind the diversity is a single power. So, do you, do you understand that you should not try to find things which are uniform? One more. Yes. So when uh, people say that uh, Hindu is not a religion or Hindu is not a different identity, Yes. Like Muslims and Christians. Right. So how it has been made earlier, but uh, like can we study it so uh, in an isolation, or we have to study it with the invasions which we had in the past? <laughs> Look, I'll be very brief. Isn't there a series of philosophical systems? deeply interrelated to each other by which people have lived for thousands of years? Kya aisa nahi hai? Wasn't there something called the Vedic texts, the Upanishads and the Smritis by which people were living, the values the people held? Then later on came Ramayana and Mahabharata and other texts, the great poets, then in the medieval times came the writings of great other poets like Tulsidas. Before this, there were so many other texts about how you should produce art, how you should produce beautiful things in life. Now all this is part of a single tradition. And this is the tradition of a people, the people of India. So if they are living by certain values, if they are living by certain notions of what is right and wrong and good, then you can give it any name. Some, at some point, people started calling the people following these values as Hindus or Hindus. And then the word stuck. And the people of this land, although named by foreigners as Hindus, came to be known by Hindus. But behind all this is the name of the river Sindhu, which is not a foreign river, which is an Indian river. So even in the word Hindu, which was used by non-Hindus for us as a people, they were denoting us by this land in terms of a river. So to say that there is no Hinduism, it's just uh, almost a mischievous idea. There are people who have believed in things, a series of things, the philosophies and ideas which have existed all this while. So this is a reality. It's not somebody else's uh, imagination. Yes, sir. Yeah. So next we have next questions. question. Yeah. So has anyone asked about uniform civil code? Oh, okay. Yeah. A uniform civil code, can it be applied in the country? Well, the constitution of India uh, in the directive principle says that there should be a uniform civil code. Uh, most so-called developed countries who are in many ways, in certain uh, important ways, uh, in terms of life values, our ideals like United States and uh, countries of Europe, they all have uniform civil code. And uh, the problem with not having uniform civil code are immense because it creates more discrimination among the people of a country than anything else. The laws which were formulated for Hindus and Muslims 
are pretty much the same except in terms of marriage and inheritance. You don't cut a Muslim's hand if he is caught stealing. You don't, he doesn't say treat me according to Sharia. He likes to be treated as uh, the Indian penal code. So why not in marriage? And Hindu uh, marriage laws have undergone immense change. Yes. They are not the same as they were 500 years ago. So they have modernized. Uniform civil code is not going to be the Hindu majority civil code. It is all the the Hindu civil code is already a modern code which has absorbed a lot of Christian values and modern European values. So let us not uh, be partial on religious grounds. Let us accept that uh, moral codes change according to times and let us accept those codes which are best for majority of human beings or rather all human beings and especially for women. Excellent. Yeah. So we'll take one more. Yeah. Can the caste-based discrimination ever be eliminated? Why you want to eliminate caste? Caste is undergoing transformation. Caste was an economic order. That people of different skills and abilities will make their living according to certain groups called Varanas or Jatis. Now those Varanas and Jatis are getting redefined according to the skills which are dependent on changing technology. So what was there in pre-industrial times when everybody in order to manufacture something had to manufacture things by hand is not applicable anymore. So people are taking to different professions. Somebody's father who used to be a fisherman, that person is no longer a fisherman. He is taking a different kind of skill. Maybe he is an office worker or he is some kind of a uh, salesman or a shopkeeper. So the so-called Varna Ashram Vyavastha is already under a lot of transformation. India has changed. Only people who don't recognize this big change, they go back to certain definitions given 2000 years ago in Manusmriti and then they pick up a big stick and start beating Hindus by saying that you are followers of the caste system. Well, we have entirely transformed our caste system and we have modernized it. Just as uh, when you go to Cambridge and when you meet one Mr. John Smith, then you don't expect that that Smith is uh, somebody who is uh, working on a, in an iron factory. He is not a smith an ironsmith. That man can be a professor. Similarly in India, uh, somebody who may have a name like, like I have a name Gupta, which is a name of a business community, but I am a professor. So a very big transformation has taken place. And it is going on and on. Thank you so much, sir. We'll end the session here. Yeah. So, I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this special meet. I thank Dr. Bharat Gupta, sir, Gupta, sir, for his valuable contribution in the field. And thank you, sir, for spending your time with us here today. I would also like to propose vote of thanks to our senior Karikarpas present here. 
I thank all volunteers of Think India who made this session a big success. Last but not the least, I would like to thank our audience and participants for their sincere hearing. Once again, thank you all for making this program a great success. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.